But you know, I began to read my Bible. Um, I, I got saved. I just couldn't put it down. Um, I, I'd read it three, four, three, four hours a day. I'd lay down and go to sleep with it, just hugging it. <laughs> I guess those who's for, forgiven much, love him much. Yeah. Even if you'd have known me then, but I, um, I began to read my Bible and I began to read how God used broken things throughout the Bible. <laughs> And um, that little lad's loaf had to be broken before and blessed before it could be multiplied. And broken pieces of the ship that Paul was on when some men would have drowned, but they floated into the island of Melito on broken pieces of the ship. Jesus' body had to be broken. The clouds have to break before the rain comes. The sod has to break before the seed can grow. And uh, sometimes God's got to break us, doesn't he? to get our eyes open. This song talks about a story, a little girl named Maggie. You just listen to the words. Maggie came home one day with a raggedy, raggedy hand. She said, Mama, look what I found in the neighbor's garbage can. It had a missing left arm and a right button eye. Hanging by a thread She carried it gently Up to her room And laid it on her bed With the other dogs She loves the broken ones The ones that need a little patching up She sees the diamond in the rough And makes it shine like new doesn't take that much, a willing heart and a tender touch. If everybody'd love like Maggie does, there'd be a lot less broken ones. Now 20 years later at a shelter on 18th Avenue, a 17-year-old girl shows up all black and blue. With needle tracks in her left arm, almost too weak to stand. She says, I'm lost and I need help as Maggie takes her hand. She says, come on in. She loves the broken ones, the ones that need a little patching up. She sees the diamond in the rug. And makes it shine like new It really doesn't take that much A willing heart and a tender touch If everybody loved like Maggie does There'd be a lot less broken Now if you called her an angel She'd be quick to say to you That she's just doing what the one who died for her would do. <laughs> Jesus loves the broken ones, the ones that need a little patching up. He sees the diamond in the rough, and he makes it shine like new. It really doesn't take that much, a willing heart and a tender touch. If everybody loved like Jesus does, there'd be a lot less broken ones. If everybody loved like Jesus does, there'd be a lot less broken ones. Amen. Amen. Right. Hallelujah. Yeah. All right, well. I consider it an honor to be here tonight. I really do. I love Brother Smith. He has no idea. Um, how much I look up to him and appreciate Taze Valley Baptist Church. Some of, some of my best friends um, have, have, I've met here in some of the meetings. And, and uh, you probably don't know this, Brother Smith, but probably about eight or nine years ago, I was going through one of the hardest times of my life. And uh, I came to one of the camp meetings. Um, Brother Dale and I were sitting there, and um, I think Brother Brent Carr had come for the first time. And I was going through a real hard time in my life. And the Rochesters started singing, I just want to thank you, Lord. 
And in the midst of one of the roughest times I'd ever gone through since I've been saved, God broke me at the altar down here in this building. And I got closure and I got, um, I got what I needed. And God, God just um, secured in my life that everything was going to be okay at that meeting. And I never told anyone. I just took it home with me. Sometimes God will give you some things that just between you and Him. And you can't really talk about it till later on. But um, I appreciate this meeting. I appreciate what the Lord is doing for us all. And um, I, I just love God's people. I, I want you to look in your Bibles at Revelation chapter number 12. I want to read one verse. And I just feel like I'm just going to take about 35 minutes, 40 minutes tonight at the most. Pastor, is that okay? And I just want to preach my testimony tonight. My life verse um, if I was to sign a Bible, if you were to ask me, what is your life verse, Pastor Barry or Preacher Barry, I would tell you it's Revelation chapter number 12 and verse number 11. And your Bible says this, And they overcame him, who? The devil. By the blood of the Lamb. And by, watch this, the word of their testimony. And they loved not their lives unto the death. Can you believe that God Almighty... Think so much about your testimony that he put it in the same verse as the blood of the Lamb. I'm not saying your testimony is as important as the blood of the Lamb. But God thought it important enough to put it in the same verse. Now we know there's nothing more precious or powerful than the blood of the Lamb. But can you imagine a testimony getting washed in the blood of the Lamb? How powerful your testimony would be we're not up here to brag on our past. We're not up here to brag on how much dope we smoked or how much liquor we drank. But my goodness, if we can't tell somebody where we came from without somebody looking at you and saying you're bragging on your past, God help us. These youngins need to know where we came from and they need to know what it's done to us. And, and so I want to just give you a little bit of my testimony tonight. Dr. Smith, again, thank you uh, tonight. And don't miss tomorrow night. The night that you miss is the night that the glory will fall or a fight will break out. And either one of them is worth coming to camp meeting to see. And there is a complaint department. I didn't even know it. Right out back, right over here, there's four of them, I believe, lined up. And you just go in there, lock yourself in, and start complaining. You'll come out blue like a Smurf, praise God. Because somebody's going to hear you and, sh and get you all shook up. I love this stuff right here, man. I love it. I grew up in it. My mom, I was born the first time in September the 4th of 1972. I was born into a drunkard's home. My dad was 21 years old before he ever stepped foot into a church. And actually the second time, the first time my dad went to church, he was about 9 or 10 or 11 years old. God rest his soul. He passed away a year ago this month. And, but he went to church one time on the church bus. They stopped and picked him up in Big Stone Gap, Virginia. And, and as he went to church, he came home, he got off the bus, and his mother, my grandma, who is now in heaven, was not saved at the time, and she literally scorned my father for going to church. She said, Randy, we don't go to church. We're not church-going people. There's a great responsibility that comes with going to church. Don't you ever go back to church again in your life. And so my dad thought it not right to go to church. And so at a young age, he began to steal and he began to drink. And, and one thing led to another. And he became a full-fledged drunk by the time he was a teenager. He met my mom. My mom and dad got married. My mom, what little bit, she's watching tonight, live stream. According to her own testimony, what little bit of, of religion that she had growing up was Catholicism. And they never even really practiced that. So really my mom and dad, for all practical purposes, never went to church, never heard anything about God, um, never heard the, the simple plan of salvation. But at the age of 21, my dad had become a drunk. They were living next door to some folks who told him one day, they said, look, man, if you want to get free entertainment, go down to the old country church at the corner of Alpine and Percival Roads. There's this old-fashioned preacher down there who is a maniac. His name is Dr. Alvin Fleming. And you will go down there. There's no cover charge. Just go sit down, watch the show, and leave and laugh and make fun of him. It's a great time. Just go watch the show. And so my mom and dad got a babysitter for my older brother and I and went to see the show at the Old Country Church. And little did they know at the Old Country Church, the man of God had been praying all afternoon that Sunday afternoon and and he had been asking God to send another victim in for the gospel. 
And so my mom and dad came in to see the show, but that man of God got up there with the Holy Ghost from the top of his head to the bottom of his feet, opened up a King James Bible, zeroed in on my mom and dad on the right-hand side about three-quarters of the way back, and began to preach the hide off the walls, boys. My dad said, according to his testimony, he said that man of God got up there and preached against everything he had ever done. He hung them out over hell for about 20 minutes, condemned them under the law, preached everything that he could preach against. My dad looked at my mom and said, I've done everything that preacher has preached against. I'm going to that hell. I'm not feeling all so good in this church right now. But he said after about 20-25 minutes of condemnation and hell, fire, and brimstone, that man of God got a smile on his face. He said, now sinner friend, I've got good news for you. There was a man named Jesus who went to a hill called Calvary and shed every drop of blood that he had in his body so that you don't have to go to that place called hell. And he looked at Miss Johnson and Brother Gary and he said turn to page number 81 in the old red back church hymnal and let's sing a verse of just as I am and as they begin to sing just as I am without one plea my dad looked at my mom and they stood up and the first time forever going to church together they held hands and walked an old fashioned aisle to an old fashioned altar and got John 3 3 gloriously washed in the blood and born again are you hearing me and God almighty took the Pat's blue ribbon out of his hand put a King James Bible in his place and from that day forward we went to church every time the doors were open every time I grew up going to Sunday school Sunday morning training union and Sunday night do y'all remember training union we used to have training union we had prayer meeting on Monday night Tuesday we would have a work day. Wednesday, we'd have midweek service. Thursday, we'd go watch the, tur- the grass grow. Friday, we'd go door knocking. Saturday, we'd go fellowship somewhere and do it. We was in church every night of the week. And Greer Baptist Camp Meeting, I grew up with Dr. Uh, uh, Billy Kelly, was a friend of our family, Mays Jackson, Harold Seitler, Ralph Sexton Sr., some of them old-fashioned preachers. I grew up with them. I didn't even realize the caliber of men that, that God had put into my life. I was in the inner chambers, Dr. Smith of the tabernacle and didn't even know it. My dad got called to preach after he got saved and we moved to Pennsylvania. I spent four years there. I went to high school there and fell in love with a little blonde-headed girl and dated her for about a year and a half, almost two years, and we got into an argument and we broke up. I was working at the Weaver's House of Chicken in the Morgantown Outlet Mall, called it the Mom Mall, in the food court. I thought I was bad to the bone. I had my mullet. I had the keys to the store, and I was, I was selling chicken sandwiches. <laughs> Around the corner, there was a fellow who run the liquor store, and he would always come buy sandwiches for me. And one day he looked at me, and he said, Barry, he said, you, you handle yourself pretty good. He said, he said, you always hook me up with extra things on my plate. He said, if you ever want anything to drink, like liquor or alcohol-wise, he said, you come around the corner, and if nobody's in the store but me, I'll sell you anything you want. Just don't tell nobody where you got it from. I looked at that man that day, and I said, I said yeah, man, thank you, because I wanted to be cool. But deep on the inside, I'm, th- I'm saying, no, thank you. I, done, I know what the preacher said about drinking liquor. I know what the preacher warned me about getting drunk and dying uh, a, a drunkard and a drug addict. I said, yeah, thank you. But inside, I'm saying, no, thank you. But this particular day, I was hurting. I tried to get back with my girlfriend. She didn't want me back. She didn't found. Can you believe, Lauren, she found someone better looking than me? It's hard to believe, ain't it? I ain't always been bald and ugly. I went around the corner that day in a weak moment. Nobody, can you believe the devil had it all set up? I said, give me a fifth of Jack Daniels. Give me a pack of Marlboros and some rock and roll music. And I bought all three. I said, if you're going, if you're going to send, you might as well go big. Put it all in a brown paper bag. Rolled it up, put it in the broom closet and finished my shift. I can take you to the spot. We're about 10 o'clock that night as I had closed up the store. Got into a 1986 Camaro. Backed up on the back side of a mall parking lot, looked up through the sunroof and told God I was going to beat the system. I said, God, I'm going to drink one little bit. I'm going to smoke a little bit. I'm going to listen to a little bit of Def Leppard. Hysteria is what I had. And I said, God, when I'm done with all my sins, I, you're going to forgive me. Mom and dad ain't going to find out about it. I'm going to go on about my business. I'm not going to end up like the preacher said. And I popped the top on the fifth of Jack Daniels and poured liquid fire down my throat for the first time in my life at the age of 17 and a half, almost 18 years old. 
About 30 minutes later, I, I said, no, you got to get home. you got to get home before mom and dad find out where you're at. And so I, I rolled everything up, put it up underneath the seat, went home, and, and I thought I got by with it. But the next night, the devil said, you got, you got some left. Why not just finish that bottle off? And so the next night at about quarter to 10, 10 o'clock, I took another drink and another drink the next night. And then that bottle ran out and I had to get another bottle. And then I met a boy who said, man, if you think that's living it up, why don't you try one of these pills called a Tylox? And if you'll mix these opiates with that alcohol, you'll feel even better. And so dummy me, I started taking opiates and Oxycontin and Tylox and Percocets and all that stuff, which are needful sometimes when you've got pain. But I didn't have any pain. I was just taking it to get high. And then my brother come by my apartment on North 4th Street in Reading, Pennsylvania. He said, hey, little brother, if you want to you wanna, you wanna top off the high that you've been feeling with the pills and the alcohol, try some of this. And he dumped an eight ball of cocaine out on a glass coffee table, chalked out a line and taught me how to snort co cocaine at 18 years old. What I didn't realize was 13 years later, I was going to find myself with needle tracks in my arms, 145 pounds, scabs all over my body, riding with tattooed from my, from my neck to my belt. Oh, listen, cocaine in my nose, whiskey on my breath, hell's angels on my back, uh, heading to hell on a Harley Davidson motorcycle. I was going to make a big splash on the lake of fire and impress the devil. That's how foolish I was. Uh, I found myself totally consumed with the sin of this world. They said I'd been up for four days. I really don't remember. But the guy said, I've been up for four days dealing, dealing drugs to several gang or clubs that had, had allied together in the coalition with the Hells Angels. And, and they said, I passed out for about two hours in a Hells Angels clubhouse, Tyler. I woke up after about a two-hour pass out and I had dope all over my, I had it, I had it packed all over me because I'd been dealing it. I had a stolen gun on my side. And I remember waking up on an old grungy couch in that clubhouse, Dr. Smith. And I remember scratching my head. I didn't even know what day of the week it was. I didn't know, I didn't know where I'd been, how long I'd been up, when's the last time I seen my wife. It took me a few minutes to even to gather my thoughts and realize it was a Sunday morning somewhere around 8.30. I looked at the floor and over to my left there was a puddle of blood where someone had got cut the night before. I remember looking at that blood and, and thinking, I wonder who got hurt last night. I wonder if it was one of our guys or a guest or someone who didn't belong here. And I, and I walked from there and I walked over to the bar area in the clubhouse. And on the other side of the bar, there was a fellow who had been bartending and he had a great big long beard and he had thrown up the night before too many drugs and alcohol and there was half digested food and mucus all stuck up in his beard. And I can, I, I, it, God impressed that into my mind. And I remember thinking, boy, that is sick. That's sick. I walked from there past the jukebox which sat right about here and I could tell you the song that was playing on the jukebox that morning. And I walked from the jukebox back over to the couch. And as I sat down, Dr. Smith, there was all kinds of laughter in the backyard because it was a block party and a, and a weekend party. There was all kinds of laughter going on back there. And, and back behind me in the front yard, there was all kinds of motorcycles being cranked up. I could smell marijuana in the air. I could hear the jukebox. Kid Rock was playing on the jukebox. And, and all of these things was riding in on my mind. And for the first time in 13 years, out of nowhere, the Holy Ghost of God sat down in my lap in a Hell's Angels clubhouse. You say, preacher, I don't make any sense to me that, that God would go into a, a, a Hell's Angels clubhouse. I, I don't mean to mess up your theology. All I can tell you is exactly what happened to me. The Holy Ghost, hey, mom and daddy was praying and God was moving. Hey, mom and daddy done prayed the hounds of heaven on my heels. I found myself going into crack houses. I could hear, I, all I could think about was dying and going to hell. I found myself going into tattoo parlors. All I could think about was dying and going to hell. But that morning, I was sitting on that couch and when the jukebox are blasting and the motorcycles cranked up and the laughter and the partying out of nowhere the Holy Ghost of God captivated my mind all of a sudden I couldn't hear the jukebox I couldn't hear the motorcycles I couldn't hear the laughter I couldn't smell the smoke God took over my mind and all I could see and all I could hear was me as a 10-year-old boy sitting on the front row of the Greer Baptist camp meeting. And all I could see and all I could hear was old Bill, Dr. Billy Kelly getting up with that fiddle he had 
And he'd get up there and he'd say, Like the prodigal son, I wandered in darkness. I traded my life for a world of good times. No peace in my heart I ever could find. And I got so tired of eating after the swine. Tears begin to roll down my cheeks for the first time in 13 years. I'm trying to wipe the tears away in case somebody walks in. And, and out of nowhere, I, I, tried to, I tried to hear Kid Rock on the jukebox. I tried to listen to the motorcycles. But God said, uh-uh, not this morning. And old Billy Kelly got to that course where he said this. I believe I'll go home and eat with the Father. The table is spread. They're waiting for me. <laughs> I can see the Father coming out to greet me. Lord, I'm willing to be just a servant for Thee. I stood up. I walked out front and I got on my bike. 1999 Harley Davidson fat boy. I said, if I can just get home and see my wife, if I can just get home and see my kids, if I can just go home and talk to mom and dad, something ain't right in my heart. Something ain't right. I need God. I need God. It was about a 45-minute ride. My wife had been taking our youngins to church. Our son was 10. Our daughter was 2. My wife had had enough of carburetors in the dishwasher cocaine on the coffee table and hell's angels and Carolina rebels and outlaws doing burnouts in her front yard. She was sick and tired of it. She was sick and tired of me and I don't blame her. She was just going to church and here to her own words. She said, I'd go to church and Tyler, she said, I'd sit there and I'd close my eyes while the man of God was preaching and I would just daydream and imagine what it must be like to have a husband who wasn't a drug dealer but was a man of God preaching God's word. <laughs> It was a Sunday morning when I left that clubhouse. I pulled up to the only stoplight that Elgin, South Carolina has. As I pulled up to that stoplight, the light turned red, and God froze that stoplight. It seemed like 30 minutes I sat there. I honestly believe to this day that God stopped the stoplight for a while. You say, Preacher, God wouldn't do that. Well, He made the sun stand still for Joshua, didn't He? He ain't got no trouble with a stoplight in Elgin, South Carolina. Because as I come to that stoplight, that four-way stoplight on the other side directly in front of me was my wife. God had it all worked out. She's going to church. I'm coming home from a four-day high. She has not heard from me. As I sat there with 21-inch ape hangers and that thing loping, boom, 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 boom. I never wanted the light to turn green so fast in all my life. But God, you said you're going to sit here and you're going to look at her. And as I looked at my wife, she didn't say a word. She just shook her head. And I could see as she was wiping tears out of her eyes. She didn't say a word to me because I, I wouldn't have been able to hear her voice. But her heart began to scream. Honey, where have you been? I didn't sign up for this. I don't even know if we're going to have electricity tomorrow because there's a red sticker on the electric meter and you haven't paid the electric bill. I don't even know if I'm going to have this vehicle to drive to work because they've been calling my phone off the hook all week wanting to know where the car payment is and, and you're nowhere to be found and you're wasting your paycheck on wine and women and song. And hey, the kids are going to bed hungry and all that's in the refrigerator is beer and there's no milk and no bread. Hey, honey, when are you going to come home and be a dad and be a husband? Our son Cody was 10 years old. He peeked out from behind his mama and pointed through the front window as if to say, Hey, Dad! Mama goes to bed crying every night. I don't know what it's like to have functionality. I don't know what it's like to see you and mom laughing and cutting up and kissing in the living room. And I don't know what it's like to throw a football in the front yard, Dad. All I know is Hell's Angels and Carolina Rebels and drugs and rock and roll music. And, and Dad, I go to bed insecure and, and I cry myself to sleep. Daddy, will you come home, Dad? Our little girl, Alexis. Had her little Sunday dress on. She peeked out from behind the front seat and from her car seat and pointed at me as if to say, Hey, Dad, it won't be long. I'll have a property of patch on my back. I'll belong to them boys down there. They'll own me. They'll pass me around and I'll be pregnant out of wedlock and I'll have STDs and tattoos. And Hey, Dad, there's nothing you can say about it because you're teaching me that that's a way of life. 
And God said, that'll be about enough. And the light turned green. My wife just shook her head at me. She remembers that moment just as real as I do to this day. She turned right on the Two Notch Road, number one, and I went straight two and a half miles to my house. As I pulled through that light, I'm glad I was riding a Harley that, moment, that morning because I'm not sure God would have got on a Honda. <laughs> but I happened to be on a Harley. Tears begin to flow down my eyes again and I'm trying to wash them and brush them away while I'm trying to ride and I don't know where the Holy Ghost of God got on the back of that motorcycle. Folks, I, I'm just being honest with you. I, I don't think I, I, I was having trouble breathing. That's how real it was. I knew I needed God. I knew I needed Jesus. I knew my sin was wrong, but I went home and I, I crawled up in the bathroom and I locked the door and I laid down on that cold linoleum floor, hair down to my belt, tattoos all over my body, needle tracks in my arms, cocaine up my nose, and whiskey bent, hell bound, half drunk, hollow eyed, heading to hell on a Harley Davidson. And I cried out to God, God, I can't break free. I can't. Maybe you're thinking, what could you not break free from, preacher? Two things mainly. Number one, the drugs. It had me locked down. I wasn't just smoking reefer. I was shooting up heroin and taking opiates for 13 years. You don't just put that down and walk away from it. There's a eight, at least eight weeks of hardcore severe detox that your body goes through. I tried to put it down. I, I was tired of being hooked on stuff. But every time I tried to put it down, my body would lock down on me and I just couldn't deal with the pain. The second thing I was having trouble with was the tattoo that's on my back. My entire back is tattooed club colors with red and white. And they told me, those club members, as they stood over me, I was the only one in the whole crazy coalition of, of bikers that, that had my entire back tattooed. I mean, if you're going to go, go big, right? And they told me, Dr. Smith, while they was putting that, their colors, top rocker, bottom rocker, and center patch on my back, if you ever try to get out of this club... Here's what they said. We will skin your back with a blowtorch. We'll hold you down and skin your back if you ever try to get out. I'm laying there in the, on the floor and I'm going, God, I don't know what to do. How do I get out of this mess? I didn't get saved that Sunday morning, but listen to me real good. The Holy Ghost said something that I had not heard in a very long time, if ever. He said, hold on, help's on the way. See, I wasn't quite done with my sin yet. But I was that close. I got up. I shook it off. I wiped them tears back. I looked down on that linoleum floor. My head was right beside the toilet. It looked like someone had poured a bottle of water on the floor. That's how many tears I'd cried. And that was on a Sunday morning. Eight days later. What's the eight? The number of new beginnings. The following Monday morning, October the 27th, 2003, about 9.30 in the morning, I woke up. I walked in that same bathroom and I looked in that mirror and I realized the wretch that I was. It was so bad what I was looking at, my life. And I said, my God, there's got to be more to life than what I'm living. And at that moment, I said, I'm done. If they kill me getting out of the club, if I die going through detox, I am getting to the cross. At that moment, I believe, is when I got saved. Because I stepped away from that mirror, and I was done. That's when I was calling upon God in my heart. I was repentant of my sins, and I was turning towards Jesus. But see, mom and dad represented God to me. And so I went to the telephone. I went to what's called a landline. That's a telephone without a cord hooked to it. Or with a cord hooked to it. I don't know where the cord goes. It goes down to the floor, under the house somewhere. I don't know how that, but it works. You can't ride down the road. I picked up that phone. I called my mom who lives right next door. I said, Mom, there's something bad wrong with me. And Mama hung up the phone on me. I'm standing there going, Mama just hung up on you. You know you're in bad shape when Mama hangs up on you. Mamas don't hang up on their babies. I stood there. I said, what are you going to do now? You're finally ready and Mama's hanging up. Little did I know that five minutes later, her and my dad was coming through the back door. Mama was out, out stepping daddy, had that blood red back King James Bible tucked up under her arm and that 40 foot finger ready to pound me in the nose. She said, son, I know what your problem is. You're a sinner. I said, mom, you're right. But see, for 13 years, all she's heard is, mom, I don't want to hear it. So it didn't register. I said, mom, you're right. She said, stop arguing with me. She said, 
Your problem's not drugs and motorcycles. Your problem is you're a sinner and you're going to fry like fat back in hell if you don't get saved. I said, Mom, you're right. She said, stop arguing with me, boy. You're not going to burn your candle at both ends for the devil and blow smoke in God's face come time to die. You need to get saved. I said, Mom, I know. She said, what? <laughs> Did you say? I said, I know. Mama got into the third heaven just because I said I know. Amen. See, because all she'd ever heard was leave me alone, I'm okay. But see, you can't get somebody saved until you get them lost. I got lost that morning. And mama knew there was help for me. She said, son, come over here and let me show you what the word of God says. Went to a couch. Everything happened on a couch. She's knelt down on a clean couch in my living room. She opened up that blessed old book and she began to read. She said, son, do you know what the Bible says? That all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. I said, mama, I'm so short of God's glory. I said, I'm the world's biggest sinner. She said, the Bible says the wages of sin is death. Do you believe that? I said, mama, I'm almost dead. Will you get to the good part? She said, oh yeah. She said, there's the good part. But God commendeth his love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And she said, if you'll confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. She looked over at me to see if I was ready to say the sinner's prayer, but I was already eating carpet fiber, buddy. I said, God, if you're as real as mama says, if you're as real as that preacher man told me you are, if you're as real as that Bible says you are, and you can save somebody like me, save me, Jesus! He said, what happened that morning, preacher? I went down a beggar, baby, and came up a millionaire, about 10 guys of galvanized glory come down to my soul and I got saved. Amen. Amen. Y'all need to get me a pulpit I can jump up on. I'm used to jumping up on the pulpit right about that point. My body normally jumps when I say I went down a beggar and came up a millionaire. Does it not? How many times have you seen my testimony? I always jump on the pulpit. Get me a pulpit I can jump up on. My body says you didn't make it. I feel like I got to complete the task. <laughs> that was on a Monday morning, October 27, 2003. That Friday night, make a long story short, I had to go turn in my colors, get out of the club. Make a long story short on that part of it. Man, they didn't take a blowtorch to my back. Had to get some cover-up work done. Brother Dale's seen my back. Some of these guys that have been to camp with me seen it. It doesn't look all that pretty, but it's better than a blowtorch, amen? I had been going to, how much time do I have? Do I have 10 minutes? I've been going to church. I mean, bro, you talk about falling in love with Jesus. I fell in love with Jesus. I, I immediately flushed all the pills, all the heroin, all the cocaine, got rid of all the rock and roll music, all the... I mean, I might, I might get stoned for this, but I got rid of all my country music. Because all I could hear in that country music, all I could hear was drinking, fornicating. I said, well, my goodness, I shouldn't be listening to that. And no one even had to tell me. Y'all come back tomorrow night, it'll get better. I'm just telling you my testimony. The Holy Ghost told me it was wrong. See, what you got to understand, that the devil can't get your kids in murder rap. He'll get them on the back, he'll get them on a tailgate with a, with a, with a deer rifle and an eight-point buck saying, if you're a good old boy, you'll make it to heaven. If you can just drink beer and, 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 and shoot a deer every once in a while and get a deer head mounted, you'll be all right. But let me, there's nothing wrong with going hunting, praise God. I love to hunt. But if you've never been washed in the blood of the lamb and, you, and all you do is think about being a good old boy and worshiping nature, there's something wrong. So I'm getting rid of all that stuff and... But I was going to the methadone clinic. I might step on some toes here, but I'm giving you my testimony. Modern day Suboxone and Subutex, methadone, it's all the same sorry stuff. It just, keep, it just keeps you from going through withdrawal, and it keeps your, your mind messed up. I was on 120 milligrams of methadone, and I was going, and I'd, I was, I, I'd gotten all, rid of all the drugs, the, the major drugs, the street drugs. I'm, 120 milligrams of methadone, that's a lot, isn't it? Yeah, I don't know. You're not supposed to know that. <laughs> I'd gotten some take-homes. I had about six or eight days of take-homes because I'm passing the cocaine and the marijuana and all that stuff, so they give you take-homes at the methadone clinic. I'm going to church. I've not gone through withdrawal. I'm a happy camper. I'm like, man, I'll just stay on methadone because the doctor's writing the prescription. I'll just stay on that the rest of my life. I'll never have to go through withdrawal from the heroin or the opiates. 
My pastor came to me one day. Now, he had been preaching a series of messages. You've got to get this. On the world, the pictures of the world, the Egyptians, the Babylonians, the Moabites, and the Philistines. And they're all pictures of how Satan will attack God's people in different tactics. So I'm writing down, boy, I know some Philistines. Oh, I definitely know some Babylonian uh, 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 garments. I know, the, the, I know the Egyptians. I know the, the, um, the Moabitish women. I started writing all this stuff down and, and looking at it and studying it. And my pastor came to me one day and he said, Brother Barry, he said, someone told me, come to find out it was my mother. Someone told me that you've been going to the methadone clinic. I said, yes, sir. Every, listen, every week I go get my take-homes. I said, man, I don't miss a dose every day. I'm dosing. I mean, preacher, all is well. <laughs> he began to show me in the Word of God about being sober and clear-headed and sober-minded and being let, let this mind be in you which also in Christ Jesus. He said, do you think Jesus would go to the methadone clinic? I said, no, sir. He said, what makes you think it's okay for you to go? And here's what he said. He said, if you want God to use you, to the capacity that I feel he wants to, you're going to have to get off of methadone. And I looked at my pastor and I said, if you say God's telling me to get off of it, I'll accept it. I didn't argue with him. I didn't need a series of messages on it. But see, I knew what that meant. I gave him the thumbs up, called made an appointment at the methadone clinic downtown Columbia. Same sorry place is still there. I called Dr. Merlin, made an appointment. Anytime you change anything, you've got to go through the doctor. If you, if you want to come down off of your dose or up your dose, if you're nodding off and you need less or you're, you're getting too anxiety, uh, anxieties are coming on you and you need more, you're not lasting long enough, whatever, or you want to mix your benzos or change your volume with your Xanax or whatever, I mean, it's all just a great big old cocktail. You've got to change that through the doctor. Then you take your new prescription, you walk around the corner. I know what I'm talking about. You give it to the RN. She gives you your dose. She watches you take it, and you go home going about your business. But the funny part is this, <clears throat> when you see the doctor, you walk into a room that's about half the size of this tent, it's a concrete floor with cinder block walls, and he's got his desk right in the middle of the room, and metal chairs are lining up the walls, and everybody hears everybody's business. Whatever you're seeing the doctor for, everybody hears it, because everything echoes in that room. So I'm thinking the whole way there, <clears throat> I made an appointment to see him, but he doesn't know what I want to see him about. <clears throat> I'm thinking the whole way there, now these doctors are there to help you, right? Right? So I'm going to tell him that I want to get off of methadone, and I'm actually going to do it. And he's going to wing me down. About two weeks, I'll be over it. It's going to hurt, but I'm going to get through this. And, and you know what, man? He's going to put my name up in lights. I'm going to be the poster boy. I'm going to be the guy that he calls when somebody else wants to get off of it. He's going to be so proud of me. I'm going to get a standing ovation at the methadone clinic this morning. That's what I thought. So I'm sitting there, and two or three people went before me, and he calls me up, and I'm sitting there in front of him, and I got a smile on my face, and Dr. Merlin, he says, Mr. Spears, what can I do for you? I said, I want to get off of methadone. <laughs> he wasn't smiling. Because, see, he gets $10 a day for every person that goes through there. That's a lot of money. He said, you do, huh? And he pulled out my rap sheet, Brother Smith. He began to look at, because when you sign up for the methadone clinic, you've got to tell him everything that you're on. He begins to read all the different things that I've been taking, the, the gang affiliation, all that stuff, my arrest record, all that stuff. And he's reading it to everybody, and I'm going, oh, man, head hurts, belly hurts, can't find my cigarettes. <laughs> I mean, I'm looking for my rosary beads. I'm like, everybody is listening to my mess. And he finally puts my, he puts my, my book away. He said, Mr. Spears, you'll never get off of methadone, never. You will always need something to level your mind out after 13 years of that. Man, it floored me, man. It sucked the life out of me. But Zach, it really tore me up. And for about 10 seconds, I'm sitting there defeated. But y'all remember that same Holy Ghost that met me in that Hells Angels clubhouse? That same Holy Ghost that got on the back of that Harley Davidson? That same Holy Ghost that had saved my soul a few weeks prior. That same Holy Ghost sat me up in that metal chair. And I got boldness like I'd never felt with that doctor. He's got more degrees than the thermometer above his head. And here I am, just an old plow boy looking at him. I, I felt like Jacob going in there to bless Pharaoh. I, I looked at him and I said, sir, look at me in these eyeballs that God gave me. I said, you see that fellow sitting over there with Ozzy tattooed on his knuckles? That fellow goes, you talking about me? I said, you. I said, hey, Doc, that's an Egyptian. All I knew is what my preacher had been telling me. That boy said, 
A what? I said, Egyptian, shut up. Now ain't the time to argue. He said, oh. I said, you see that girl sitting beside him with that tie-dyed shirt on? That's a Moabitess woman. He said, you talking about my girl? I said, she's a Moabite and you're an Egyptian. I'm freaking out on him, man. I feel like it's closing in on me. I got to break out. I'm in survival mode, you know? Y'all street fighters, you know what I'm talking about? No holds barred, buddy. I said, you see the dude over there with the Motley Crue t-shirt on? That's a Philistine. And the other one right there, that's a Babylonian. The doctor said, oh, what a what a deal, what? I said, Philistine, Babylonian, Egyptian, Moabite. I said, you know who I am? I kid you not. He pushes his chair back. He said, Mr. Spears, there's no telling who you are. I said, I stood up, kicked my chair back like I was in some movie. I said, I'm a child of God. Yeah. And my Bible tells me you are of God, little children, and have overcome them because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. I said, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. For if any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that's in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of the life is not of the Father, but it's of the world. And the world passes away, and the lust thereof. But he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. Blessed is the man that, that endureth temptation. For when he's tried, he shall receive a crown of life which the Lord had promised to them who love him. I said, you look at me, Doc. I'm not coming back here. And I turned to walk away. He said, you'll be back in less than three days just like everybody else. He should have never said that. Because if I was going back to the clinic, I'm going to Florence. I done burnt that bridge. I'm almost done. I went home and I told my wife. I said, honey, I can't go back to the methadone clinic. She said, I figured that. What'd you do? Go up there and cause a scene like you always do? I said, yeah. <laughs> she said, I just knew you were going to do that. She said, you got to learn to control yourself. I said, well, it didn't happen this morning. I said, um, I, said I can't go back up to that clinic. I'm done with methadone. She said, my wife looked at me, all five foot zero of her. She said, oh, okay. <laughs> I pulled a Randall Spears senior on her. I said, hey, woman. That's how we say it down in South Carolina. I said, hey, woman, come here. She said, oh, what? I said, I don't think you understand. I said, it's going to be bad around here for about eight weeks and probably even longer. I said, you've never known me a sober day in my life. I said, the day we met, those two pills that fell out of my pocket. She said, oh, yeah, you said they were for your acid reflux. I said, that was Tylox. I was already a pill head when I met you. I said, you've never known me a sober day, but you're getting ready to. She said, what do I have to expect? I said, well, my head's going to feel like it's going to explode. I'm going to be an emotional roller coaster, suicidal. My legs are going to cramp and ache. My, my abdominal muscles, I'm going to be puking. I'm going to have diarrhea. Um, cold chills, fever. I said, it's going to be really bad, really bad for eight weeks and probably a full year to recover. My wife looked at me. She said, oh, my goodness, really? I said, listen, if you're not willing to go through this with me, I understand. But you need to decide before I go in there and flush that stuff down the toilet. My wife looked at me, Dr. Smith. We had been together 10 years at the time. She looked at me and she put her hand on, my, on the back of my neck and she said, I told you when I married you before God Almighty, it was for good or for bad, for rich or for poor, yes. in sickness and in health, until death do we part. She said, I've got your back. And I looked at her and I said, no, I'm in my right mind right now, but I'm not going to be tomorrow at this time. I said, I don't know what I'm going to say. I don't know what I'm going to do. I said, but you're going to have to push me through this. She said, I'll do it. We went in the bathroom and I flushed my take-homes down. And I've still got the last container. I, I've kept it as a memorial. 24 hours later, 36 hours later, it hit me like a freight train. I'm literally curled up like a baby. They don't tell you this. I'm curled up like a baby, banging my head against the wall, begging God to kill me. 
puking, diarrhea, can't make it to the toilet. I'm just being honest with you. My wife's having to clean up after me like I'm a toddler. I can't hold food down. After about three or four or five days, maybe a week, it hit me so hard. I said, d bring me the phone. I can't do this. I got to make a call. I got to get something to ease the pain. Just a couple of pills. You don't understand. I can't do this. My wife come in there. She, I never even knew she could sing. She sat down on the edge of the bed as calm as she could be, and she looked at me. She said, honey, you're not getting the phone. I went, okay. <laughs> and out of nowhere, the sweetest voice I've ever heard in my life, here's what she said. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound. That saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. It seemed to calm me down, like David playing before Saul. A few days later, it hit me again. I did the same thing. She came in there. She said, you're not getting the phone. We've come too far to turn back. Through many yes. dangers, yes. tools yes. and snares, I have already yes. come. It's grace that's brought us safe thus far, and grace will lead us home. I got up and I went for a walk around the front yard one day, and I came back to the back door. My wife was standing there holding the calendar. I said, what are you doing? She said, you know what today is? I said, no, what's today? She said, 30 days. You've been clean 30 days today. I said, good. Get out of the way. I feel like I'm going to puke. <laughs> 30 days ain't long enough. I went for a walk around the yard another time. I come back. She's holding that calendar. She said, you know what today is? I said, what? She said, 60 days today, two months you've been clean. I said, yeah, I'm feeling a whole lot better. What's for supper? Yep. Went to work one day, praise God. Came home from work about 5, 30, 6 o'clock. She was standing there waiting on me with that calendar. I said, what are you doing? She said, you know what today is? I said, I think I got an idea. She said, one year today. You've been clean one year today. You know what I found out? I found out that a day turned into a week and a week turned into a year and a year turned into two years. And this coming October the 27th will be 18 glorious, wonderful years. I've been saved by the grace of God and clean. Say, preacher, how did you overcome all that? Through the blood of the Lamb. And you know what I found out, Dr. Smith? I'm done. I've been preaching my testimony all over the country for probably at least 12 or 13 years now. And I can't tell you how many people have sent me letters and, and, and e emails and text messages saying, Preacher, you give us hope. Because our children, our grandchildren, my marriage, my husband, my wife, someone was that far down and the devil had convinced us that there was no hope. But Preacher, if God can do it for you, there's still hope for my family. And I found out what was a big, gigantic mess. I give God time to pull me out of it. Clean me up. Let me ask you a question. What if, what if I'd never went through the gauntlet of eight weeks of detox and a year to recover? I'd still be going to the methadone clinic. I wouldn't be preaching the word of God. And people wouldn't be getting help. I wonder who it is. You've got something you've gone through. But God wants you to finish it up, get rid of it, get it out of your life so that somewhere down the road he can turn that mess into a message. But you've got to prove God, man. Anybody can, anybody can quit something for 24 hours, but what about, what about 24 months? It's time to lock and load. We are in the last days. We are living in a day and age where every home, if you, listen, if, you, if, you're, if someone in your family has been influenced by drugs or alcohol to a, to a severe level, someone in your home or right close to you that you love, raise your hand. 
Look, raise your hand if somebody that you love has been affected by pills, drugs. Raise it high. That's probably three quarters of the people that's under here. It's everywhere. Somebody's got to give it up, go forward, and use what they've gone through to help people. Because if the devil can get your faith, he can keep you from being effective. Let's stand together. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. Father, I love you. I thank you for overcoming. I thank you for the blood of the Lamb. Thank you for saving me and rescuing me out of that mess. Lord, I preached a little bit longer than I should have tonight, but I just felt like your people was receiving what I had to say. And Lord, I ask you to forgive me if I went too long. But I pray that what I've said tonight, that these young people would not leave here wanting that testimony, but thanking God that they, that they don't have to have that. They were raised, Lord, those who are raised in Christian homes, they ought to be praising God. Those teenagers that have already made bad choices, let them know that the ground is still level at the foot of the cross. You can still forgive us and we can still go forward. And one day, even they can use what they've gone through in Jesus' name. Maybe as as your heads are bowed and eyes are closed, Dr. Smith will come up whenever he's finished praying, but I want to ask two questions. Number one, are you saved? Do you know Christ as your Savior? Do you remember when when the Holy Spirit convicted you of your sins and you said yes to Jesus. Put your hand up as a testimony in the old tent tonight. Boy, I know God's smiling upon that. That's the majority of us here. But I can't help, as you raise your hands, just glancing through. I noticed there was a handful who could not raise their hands. So here's what I want to ask you. If you were not able to raise your hand, Maybe you just were too lazy to raise your hand. I don't know. But if you didn't raise your hand because you really don't think that you're saved, everyone's bowing their heads for just a moment, closing your eyes. I want to give you an opportunity to come to this altar and let us take a Bible and pray with you. You don't have to leave here lost. We've got, we've got preachers. We've got Bibles. It would, it, listen, salvation is not difficult. It's simply repentance towards your sin and faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. So as Miss Lauren is playing and getting ready to sing a song, if you were not able to raise your hand, would you just look up here at me for a minute? Would you? Are you bold enough? Just look up here at me for a minute. Are you willing to come forward? Would you like for tonight to be the night that you can settle it in your soul, that you know that if, if Jesus comes back for his bride, or if you were to get killed on the way home or your heart stopped beating, you know without a doubt that you'd be in heaven with the Lord Jesus Christ. Wouldn't it be a wonderful time to to just go ahead and settle that tonight? Would you come?